Hello, today let's talk about the quantum harmonic oscillator. The first question to ask is, why do we care about the quantum harmonic oscillator? And there's quite a few reasons for this. The first reason is that quantum harmonic oscillator is one of the few systems in quantum mechanics that its Schrodinger equation is solvable by hand, which means we can get an exact solution without requesting our computers to do the job for us. And the way we're going to solve the Schrodinger equation today is by using what's called an operator method introduced by Paul Dirac. The operator method is very powerful because it allows us to extract these energy eigenvalues and the quantum states that correspond to these energy eigenvalues without solving complicated differential equations. And we use the method again when we are studying quantum angular momentum and extracting the energy levels of a hydrogen. And another reason to study the quantum harmonic oscillator is that it demonstrates many of the quantum mechanical phenomena. For example, it demonstrates the quantization of energy, which is where quantum mechanics derived its name from. It demonstrates the zero-point energy, which means a system's minimum energy is non-zero. And this is fundamentally a consequence of the uncertainty principle. And the quantum harmonic oscillator also demonstrates quantum tunneling. And quantum tunneling is a particle passing through a potential barrier with more energy than the energy of the particle. We're used to thinking about our universe as made up of particles. For example, any object, for example this chair, is made up of atoms. The tissue in our body is made up of molecules, which are also made up of atoms. Atoms themselves are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons. Protons and neutrons themselves are made of quarks, and quarks are particles. Even light are particles. In fact, they are photons. But a more fundamental way to think about our reality is to think about our reality as a fluctuation of fields. And the particles are mere excitations of these fields. And the piece of physics that's governing these excitations of these quantum fields is the same piece of physics as quantum harmonic oscillator. So basically, physicists model our universe as a bunch of these harmonic oscillators. And these quantum mechanical phenomena of a quantum harmonic oscillator have very far-reaching consequences at macroscopic scale. Without further ado, let's solve the Schrodinger equation. So the equation we're trying to solve is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And this is an eigenvalue problem. And this is basically just saying the effect of some linear operator on the vector has the effect of just stretching that vector without rotating it at all. Let's call it TISE for short. Our linear operator is the Hamiltonian, represents the total energy of the system. The eigenvalues are the allowed energy values in the harmonic oscillator, and the eigenvectors are stationary states, which are definite state of energy. Let's write down the Hamiltonian explicitly first. Classically, just the kinetic energy plus potential energy. You can get the potential energy term half k x squared by integrating Hooke's law. And the k is classically the stiffness of the spring. And omega is the angular frequency. Is defined as the square root of k over m. We can substitute this back in to get this equation on the screen here. Then after some rearrangement, we get this expression. And the numerator looks awfully like a quadratic equation in terms of p and x, but spicy quadratic equations because x and p are not normal variables. They are quantum mechanical operators, they could be differential operators or even matrices. But instinctively, we want to factorize the quadratic equation. And lucky for us, this is actually a difference of two squares. You might be asking, how is this a difference? There's literally a plus sign in the middle. But if one of the terms is imaginary, then the sum is actually a difference. Then we factorize the Hamiltonian by inspection. And let's call the one with the plus sign in the middle a. And let's call the one with minus sign in the middle a dagger. 
We have also divided through by h bar omega to make sure these operators are dimensionless for later convenience. And let's multiply the two linear factors together to find out a a dagger nearly factorizes the Hamiltonian, but not quite because x and p do not commute. But the commutator, which is the difference when you apply the two operators in different order, is i h bar. Let's substitute i h bar back into our expression. And after some cancellation, we get a a dagger equals to h over h bar omega plus a half. We can repeat the exact same argument, but if you multiply a dagger and a the other way around, you get h over h bar omega minus a half. Now we'll calculate the commutator of a and a dagger, which is just the difference of these two operators when you apply them in different order. Substitute our previous result, and then to find out the commutator of a and a dagger is 1. The commutator of a dagger and a is minus 1. These are two important results and will become very handy in later on. We then wish to evaluate the commutator of a dagger and h, but h is roughly the product of a and a dagger with all these constants floating around. Constant of this minus one half h bar just vanishes inside the commutator because numbers commutes with everything. We can also factorize the h bar omega out of the commutator because again numbers commutes with everything. We can then factor out the a dagger out of the commutator because a dagger commutes with itself. And the commutator of a dagger and a is minus one. And we have already evaluated the commutator of a dagger and a, which is minus 1. Substitute this back in to find out the commutator of a dagger and h is minus h bar omega a dagger. This is a very important result and it will become useful in the next bit. When you solve the quadratic equation, you want to equate one of the linear terms to 0 and then to solve the individual linear terms separately. And now we're going to do something very similar. We want to use one of the factors of the Hamiltonian, which is this a dagger, onto a stationary state and see what happens. But we don't have a second equation to tell us what this result actually is. So let's use the uh, Schrodinger equation to help us. We multiply the Schrodinger equation on both sides with a dagger. A dagger is a linear operator, so it just passes through the constant of this e. We then want to switch the order of h and a dagger. But we're not supposed to do this because a dagger and h do not commute with each other. So we must add the commutator in here. The commutator takes away what we shouldn't have, which is h a dagger, and gives us back what we should have, which is a dagger h. And look, a dagger h is one of the commutators we evaluated previously, is minus h bar omega a dagger. Substitute this back in and rearrange the equation. And this gives us h on a dagger on e is e plus h bar omega times a dagger on e. In other words, a dagger e is another eigenvector, is another stationary state of the Hamiltonian. It's more obvious if you compare this equation at the top with the equation at the bottom, and we have labeled the stationary state with the energy. Of the stationary state. The comparison gives us a dagger on E equals to the stationary state of E plus omega up to a constant factor. And we can repeat the exact same argument to find out the effect of A on E gives us the stationary state of E minus h bar omega. And this is true up to a constant factor. So a dagger raises the energy by h bar omega and a lowers the energy by h bar omega. A is actually called the annihilation operator because it annihilates one of the excitations. And in quantum field theory, annihilation of these excitations is same as just annihilating a particle. A dagger is the creation operator. It creates an excitation. And in quantum field theory, an excitation is a particle, so it just creates a particle. So using the creation operator, we're able to give the system more and more energy. And each time we apply the creation operator, we give the system h bar omega more amount of energy. And the annihilation operator does the opposite. It takes away h bar omega worth of energy each time we use it. And now we have a crucial question. 
is that is it possible to take infinitely amount of h bar omega worth of energy from a system? Classically, the answer is no. You cannot have a system with negative energy, and quantum mechanics agrees with this. It doesn't make sense for us to have negative energy, even in quantum mechanics. So this trend of keep taking away energy from this system must end at some point. And at the point that we cannot go further, we call it the ground state. It's a state of minimum energy. In other words, if now we use the annihilation operator on the ground state, it seems asking, what is the energy below the ground state energy? And the answer is, there is no state that has energy lower than ground state, because ground state, by construction, have the lowest amount of energy in the system. And if there is another state with lower energy than ground state, then ground state wouldn't be ground state anymore, which creates a contradiction. And because a system of having energy less than ground state doesn't exist, the vector representing that system doesn't exist. And if the vector doesn't exist, the length of that vector, of course, doesn't exist. And we calculate length of vectors by taking dot product with itself. And we're going to do a process that's analogous to this. We call it the inner product. But the idea is the, it's the same. So we represent the ground state with the E0 in this angular bracket. Then using the annihilation operator on the ground state, that does nothing. The length of this vector is, again, nothing. Length is this inner product. But A dagger A is roughly the Hamiltonian. So let's substitute the Hamiltonian back in here. And the Hamiltonian is a linear operator. It takes no interest in those constants whatsoever. And the H sandwiched between E0 and E0 just extracts the eigenvalue, which is E0. And after some rearrangement, we get E0 is half H bar omega. This is called the zero point energy. The minimum amount of energy in a quantum harmonic oscillator is non zero. It is half h bar omega, and this is a very important result. And because every time we use the creation operator on a stationary state, we raise the energy by h bar omega, so the nth excitation from the ground state has energy of n plus a half times h bar omega. And every time we use a dagger, we create a new excitation. So this n in angular bracket is the nth excitation from the ground state, and the ground state is labeled by the blue zero. The square root of n factorial is a normalization constant. It makes sure that our vectors have a length of one. Let's now think about why zero point energy exists in a quantum harmonic oscillator. So firstly, you need to know that this uncertainty principle, which states we cannot be absolutely certain about both the position and the momentum of a particle. So with this in mind, let's think about the reason behind the zero-point energy. So if you want to minimize the potential energy, the particle must be perfectly at the equilibrium, which means you need to be very certain about the position of a particle, which means you become relatively uncertain about the momentum of a particle. And when you are uncertain about the momentum, the particle can have kinetic energy. And if you want to make the kinetic energy go to zero, you must be very certain about the momentum of a particle and make sure it's zero. And when you're certain about the momentum, you become uncertain about the position, which means the particle may not be at the equilibrium. It might be experiencing some sort of force and that gives rise to potential energy. So it's not possible to both have potential and kinetic energy equal to zero. And this is the reason of the zero point energy. And in fact, at the ground state, at zero point energy, the uncertainty principle is saturated, which means that you're in a state that you have as much knowledge, as much certainty that you're allowed to by quantum mechanics. And this, more fundamentally, is a symmetry of spatial translation. So here's a nice diagram representing the results we found today. The red line is the ground state, the blue lines are the other energy levels. And we have created a ladder. This is why A and A dagger are known as ladder operators. It moves you up and down the ladder. The ground state has energy of E0, which is half h bar omega, the zero point energy. And the gap between the runs of this ladder is h bar omega. 
and the creation operator, a dagger, moves you up the ladder by one step each time you use it. And A is the annihilation operator. It moves you down the ladder by a step each time you use it. This is the end of the part one of our discussion of quantum harmonic oscillator. In the next video, we'll find out the wave function of these stationary states, and we'll use it to construct any arbitrary quantum state of a quantum harmonic oscillator. We'll also discuss about quantum tunneling, so stay tuned. Thank you for watching.